I think Mother Scholastica would be in awe. Mother Scholastica cursed and a small group of nuns first came to Duluth in the early 1880s. Before the city had paved roads or streetlights, the sisters began their work in health care and education, founding schools, and eventually a hospital. St. Mary's Hospital was established in 1888. And then the Bishop McGulrick, who was the first bishop of Duluth after it became a diocese, uh, saw the value of the sisters' presence. And so he asked if a group of sisters from St. Ben's could not come and start a monastery here. And in 1892, St. Scholastica Monastery was founded. Shortly thereafter came the Institute of the Sacred Heart, an academy for primary through secondary education. Originally housed in Munger Terrace, the Institute began to outgrow its accommodations within a year. And then um, in the early 1900s, Mother Scholastica explored this campus uh, was called, lovingly called, we still lovingly like to call it the Daisy Farm. With the financial support of her father, Peter J. Kirst, she was able to purchase the Daisy Farm, an 80-acre tract of land. 80 additional acres were soon acquired. In 1909, the first unit of Tower Hall was completed, and 75 students from Sacred Heart were relocated to the Villa St. Scholastica. Sadly, Mother Scholastica died in 1911, one year before the school officially opened as a junior college under the leadership of her blood sister, Alexia Kirst. These were hardy, courageous, pioneering women who came to do the work that the region needed and founded institutions that have been part of Duluth's history now for over a century. You know, I moved to Duluth in 1979 to go to St. Scholastica, and uh, I cannot imagine what it was like to move to Duluth in, in, in the 1910s and, and start a new community and an institution that's now grown and had such an enormous impact. And I have you know, deep, deep admiration for what these women pioneered. As I look back, I'm just so impressed by what they had accomplished in their own right as scientists, as artists, as musicians. Our sister Mary O'Deal, who um, was the first of two women to uh, winter in Antarctica doing biological research. Sister Petra, Sister Agatha, who started the cancer research. The college's history is brimming with examples of individual sisters' excellence in many and varied disciplines. One of the most notable is Sister Agnes Summers, known appropriately as The Builder. She was prioress and president from 1924 to 1942, an 18-year period of robust expansion for the college despite the Great Depression. She must have had people telling her, you're crazy to be doing this at this time, but she must have been an incurable optimist. and. Um, I've always respected that and found it, you know, because sometimes you you have to make a calculated guess. Is this a good time to do this? Is this the right thing to do? And somebody making these decisions during the Depression uh, and winning is kind of a nice role model. They really, they kind of look out for everyone on campus. Like in a, I don't know, I, I just feel like they have my back, no matter what. There's always you know, a, a group of nuns who are looking out for me somewhere, doing something so that my future is better, so I really appreciate that. In 1962, the college and the monastery became separate entities, a move made to secure a federal loan for the building of Summers Hall. And although this meant the sisters would no longer be in control of the day-to-day -day operations of the institution, the college has kept their Benedictine values at its core. The college, I think, has made the decision to take ownership of the values and the tradition that the sisters brought and not to let it slip away or let us drift from it. They haven't tinkered with that foundation at all. They've just built upon it. The campus has undergone several changes throughout the years, some of them physical, some of them cultural. Well, certainly the one that comes into my mind right away is when our college became co-ed. One has to imagine that it was a decision with a lot of opinions and not an easy one. 
but a bold one. The college has also engaged in a number of outreach programs over the years aimed at attracting disadvantaged or underrepresented groups. We want it to be a college where anyone who wants to can come here and be educated. And so to, to have in place um, endowments and scholarships and whatever is needed to make that possible. The people who are uh, from poorer families, the American Indians, the students of color, the international students, our having them come to St. Scholastica makes the college a different place, a better place, a stronger place. Through all of the growth and change, the original ministries of the sisters remain at the heart of the institution. And it's not surprising that uh, because the sisters got into healthcare and education that the long suit at the college is healthcare. Over half of our students are majoring in one or another discipline in healthcare. All of us here are, kind of have the same goals in mind, you know, to, to go out and help heal people. I mean, and I think when you're together with people with the same goals in mind, everything just kind of exponentially gets better. To be part of a profession that is um, so cutting edge, so ahead of the grid, I'm <laughs> we're the first in the nation to establish ourselves, but they kept that up. There is a natural leadership positioning that comes just from going through this department, but you can see it in every department in a school. Throughout all disciplines, the college embraces a holistic learning style that emphasizes the body and soul as well as the mind. College mission talks about intellectual and moral preparation. And that sends a signal about an ideal of what higher education should include. Rigorous work in terms of our minds and our intellectual endeavors, but at the same time doing rigorous work with the formation and the transformation of our heart. It's really about becoming a whole person, I think. Everything gets tied in together so much. I mean, um, even in the science major, we discuss like the ethics of things. There's a strong intellectual component in the Catholic tradition that we reflect on what we believe. And if our knowing and our believing are at odds, then either we aren't believing the right thing or we aren't thinking clearly. And that has all kinds of implications for an academy. You know, it's a, it, there's a reverence for intellectual inquiry. You know, Benedict's rule starts with that beautiful phrase, listen with the ear of your heart. This, this isn't about proselytizing. You know, this is about helping people to discover the truth wherever they find it. Leaving home is, was kind of scary. Like, you're, it's kind of like, I'm on my own. But being here, it's like, yeah, I'm on my own and I can do it. It's really challenged me to, to realize, people told me that when I was a kid, I could be the president if I wanted to, and Scholastic has helped me realize I totally could become the president. It's not that far-fetched. We have that beautiful tagline, go out and touch the world. And that's my prayer, our prayer, I believe, is that they will go out and touch the world with love and with hope and with life and with integrity and goodness and beauty. What we hear so many times over and over again when our students are out and about when they just graduate, people will actually remark to them, you must be a CSS student. And you try to get people to pinpoint what makes you say that. There's nothing, unless I'm wearing a badge that says I'm an alum or that I have a connection, there's nothing that you'll see in my external demeanor, but a lot that you'll see informed in, in career choices and life choices and the way you conduct your business. I feel like it'll benefit me when I go and start applying to jobs and everything, like having that name, but it's with it's the students that come, that have previously come out of here that have given it such a great name, and so I just want to continue that. For 100 years, Mother Scholastica's dream has been built by the hands, minds, and hearts of everyone associated with the college. I think she would feel like the dream is both realized and alive and growing. I think she'd be amazed with this place. 
I think higher education is flourishing here. We're international now. We have people from all over the world who are taking our classes. They're coming from farther away and they're coming for something. You know, we all have dreams and ideas and, and things that we want to do, but to actually go out and do it is hard. And I, I just think it's amazing that they dreamt it and they actually did it and followed through. And it's grown to this extent to what it is today. I live in television news and in a place that the columnist David Brooks calls Upper Blohardia. And the quiet confidence with which these nuns went about their business building this institution at a time when, as you say, women didn't even vote. Um, it's just breathtaking, it really is. The Benedictine tradition is adaptable, and that's why it survived for 1,500 plus years. And I think the act of starting a college in 1912 was a bold act. And as I think about our centennial coming up and reflect on the story myself, I think of that simple statement, all is gift. It has been gift given to us. It has been gift that we have nurtured, that we have cultivated, that we have cared well for. And it's a gift that flourishes and that will continue to flourish, God willing, into many, many years to come.